Hey everybody, it's Chris with Fish Talk Magazine. How are you? Uh, it's Thursday. Feels like a Friday, I'll be honest with you. Kind of does. Um, but uh, if you're just joining us, thank you very much for joining us for another uh, Live with Lenny. Um, I'm going to take care of some business real quick before we get started. Um, but I can see that we've got quite a few people already uh, joining us. That's awesome. Hi. Hello from Princess Anne uh, County, Maryland. Nice. Hello. Good to see you. Um, first of all, I've uh, got to take care of some business here, and, and that is, of course, um, taking care of uh, our advertisers and uh, thanking Off the Hook Yacht Sales, Hudson Marine, and JF Marine Services for sponsoring this episode. Um, as everybody knows, we can't do these things without our sponsors, and uh, we want to thank uh, them for their support. And, of course, for you for tuning in and for picking up the magazine. Now, the big news uh, we've heard recently, obviously, is recreational boating. Uh, some of the regulations have, have turned down. Obviously, we've been able to uh, do some sustenance fishing, um, and now it looks like some other uh, regulations are being relaxed now. Uh, so uh, many of the businesses that would be able to carry um, uh, fish talk will be open, hopefully. Um, and uh, we'll start to get you uh, brand new printed issues out there. But of course, you can always get the digital issue from fishtalkmag.com. Uh, the May issue um, is uh, is coming. It's not printed yet. Or I'm confused by the whole thing, I'll be honest with you. Uh, anyway, um, uh, but uh, be rest assured that uh, we're committed to you guys, and we're going to continue to get you the information you need. And... By all means, go to the website, if not just to read the digital issue, but to sign up for the Friday Fishing Reports email. That continues to be a, a, you know, a really popular, and if you're trying to go out this weekend, that's something you need to be uh, uh, subscribing to. So anyhow, uh, bringing in our angler-in-chief now uh, because he's the man. Hey, Chris. Lenny, how's it going? <laughs> Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, sure. Well, let's just jump right in. Let's go right to the first slide I got queued up for you, because today we're going to talk about specs and stripers in the shallows. But first, first, really briefly, I do want to just touch on a couple of items. Can we hit our first slide here? Oh. First slide is coming. It's on the way. I promise. Here it is. All right. That's a Kobe 220cc. Uh, I, I won't drag out the commercial part of this, folks, but the bottom line is, you know, we really appreciate the sponsors. We hope you do, too, because we can't bring you Fish Talk without them. And I particularly wanted to, to put up a slide of the Kobe here because I'm going to tell you right now, I've tested most of their model line built over the last couple of decades. And the interesting thing about this boat right here is it starts its MSRP at right around 50 grand for a 22 footer fully rigged ready to go out the door. It's a pretty spectacular price. The surprise comes when you dig into this boat, you're gonna see double clamped hoses in the bilge. You're gonna see tin copper wiring. You're gonna see backing plates laminated into the boat at all the hardware. You're gonna see the hallmarks of a well-built boat. Is it necessarily gonna be the fanciest boat in the world? Probably not. Is it gonna have air conditioning in a 22 footer? No. But when you're looking for a value center console, that Kobe Align is, it's really one you want to check out. You, you really want to just take a look at it, okay, before you make any moves. Chris, take us on to the next slide, please, because uh, this, is, this is kind of an interesting one here, because uh, we have a couple dealers in the area now, uh, both JF and Hudson, selling the North Coast. Now, fortunately, we got one on the Eastern Shore and one on the Western Shore, so it works out. But the reason I wanted to... Uh, mention these boats in specific is that if you want a cabin boat, your options these days are a whole lot more limited than they used to be. The center console market has been on fire, but as a result, a lot of builders have dropped the cabin boat lines and you just don't see a heck of a lot of them. A lot of the ones that you do see are a little rough around the edges, right? Some of the others are a little bumpy. They're not the smoothest running boats in the world. And the North Coast is neither of those things. The North and I have run these boats and honestly been a little surprised at just how well they run. Uh, this is the 25, I'm gonna verify that, make sure I got it right, the 255, yep. With twin 250s on the back, this is a 60 mile an hour boat. Shut down one engine and tilt it up, your get home power takes you 
30 miles an hour. That's pretty darn spectacular. And the thing about the North Coast, you want to bear in mind, is it has a higher level of fit and finish than you're going to find on most of the modern cabin boats. Is it the cheapest boat in the world? No, it's not. Okay. And if you're cool with a rough boat, by all means, go with a rough boat. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of a cut above. And uh, if you want a cabin boat and you're interested in, in that level of boat, check it out. All right, Chris, take me on to the next slide. Enough of that stuff. Let's get right into the fishing here. And uh, we're going to talk shallow water fishing today, specs and stripers. The reason I combine these two is because the truth of the matter is up and down the Chesapeake Bay, there are a lot of areas where that's, that's the de facto fishery. If you're casting in the shallows, you're going to catch a lot of stripers and you're going to catch specks. Um, in most of the areas up and down the bay, probably more stripers than specks. The farther south you head, the less true that becomes. Um, but we're going to talk about some different areas, and you're going to see some slides in a, in a little bit here that are uh, taken from the Tangier Sound, which I'm going to kind of call ground zero for speck fishing on the Chesapeake. Um, guys down in Norfolk will probably disagree with me, and they got a point. There's an awesome speck fishery down there that's it's pretty much the same, although you're casting to, to different types of structure. Um, Chris, go ahead and let's, let's take it to the next slide here. So I wanted to put this slide up. This is, this is from uh, last summer. And I wanted to put this up because you can see hanging out of the fish's mouth a white paddle tail. That's a, that's a four-incher. Uh, a four-inch paddle tail is an excellent choice to cast in the shallows. The, the rockfish love it, the specks love it. It's a really good lure. And when I'm jigging in open water, I'm usually going to like a six inch straight tail most of the time. But this four inch paddle tail in the shallows, is, it's just, it's a killer. Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide. And folks, I forgot to say, I, I wish I'd mentioned this, I'm sorry. If questions pop into your head as we're talking here, the whole reason we like to do this live is so we can get your questions. So plug them into the comments. Chris will take them and put them on the screen, and we'll get your questions answered. Please, by all means, jump in at any point with questions. All right. The reason I wanted to put up this one is because it's a little, little tough to see. I think you can make it out. The, uh, the lure there is a skirted lure, okay? And a lot of people always ask when it comes to the rockfish, do I need skirts, do I not need skirts? And, and you know, the answer varies depending on the situation you're in. But with the specs, what I personally have found is, it really doesn't make a hoot of difference if you have a skirt on there or not. Now, some of that is probably related to the style of the retrieve that's most effective on the trap. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But if you're wondering, do I have to use skirts for the specs? The answer is no, you don't have to. I don't think it'll hurt anything, but you don't have to. All right, Chris, let's pop over to the next one here. And uh, this is a really important slide to look at for two reasons. <clears throat> First is, I know you can't tell this from the picture, but this is at the mouth of the West River. A lot of people ask, how far south do I have to go for specs? Yeah, I, you don't have to go real far south. Uh, the day that we caught this one, we caught five keepers and two throwbacks off the mouth of the West. Does that happen every year? No. No, it does not. Uh, I'm going to say two years out of five, we get you know decent speck fishing up in this territory. Um, when you get down as far as the chop tank, let's say, uh, you got a better shot. Almost virtually every season you'll find them in the chop tank to some degree. Chop tank 20 years ago was actually kind of known for it. Uh, and then when you get down to the Tangier, it's you know even more reliable. On the western shore, you get down to the Potomac, it's even more reliable. And last year, there's a pretty good run in the packs as well, the lower packs. Not a lot of big fish, but pretty decent numbers. Um, and I have already, here's, here's your sneak peek on the fishing report that will be posted by noon tomorrow, people. Uh, we got a couple of reports of specs caught in the Potomac during the past week. So that's kind of big news. That's that's pretty darn cool. The other thing about this slide, a little, little tough to see. You can just make it out. If you look at the jig itself, it's pink. Whenever I want to focus on a spec, I will try a pink. I'm not saying it's always the most effective, okay? But there are a lot of days when it is, and I'll always try it. And uh, rockfish still hit it. It's still a good color for rock. Maybe not the best all the time. Um, but, it, it, you know, if man, when you're in spec territory, if you don't at least try a pink, I'm telling you, you got a problem. Now, we're going to put two and two together. Oh, look what I got here. Ah, does it make sense that that might be a good pick right there when you're throwing in the shallows for a mix of rock and specs? 
I'll leave you to draw your own conclusion. Chris, zing us over the next slide. All right, now, we're going to talk a little bit about retrieves here. Now, I never claim to be a graphic designer, people, so forgive me for the art, okay? This is what happens when you turn me loose on the computer and I do something. The uh, top, uh, top model represents what you might see on a standard rockfish retrieve. You really you give a jerk. You really give a jerk. You really give a jerk. You really give a jerk. The bottom model represents what I call the herky jerky. Now, the herky jerky, Chris, bring me bring me back on screen here for a minute, side by side with this slide, if you would. With the rockfish retrieve, you real jerk, real jerk, real jerk, right? And and oftentimes that works good for specs too. Okay, not always. The herky jerky is Real jerk, jerk, real jerk, 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 real jerk, 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 real, real, real jerk, 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 just go crazy, okay? And it sounds bizarre, but the specs love this sometimes. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, they absolutely love this. And the way I figured this out, funny little story. I was fishing in Sarasota, and we were on a press gig, and and it was a guided thing, and the guide was was sitting up top in the boat and um he he set me up with a four or five inch paddle tail and i threw it out there and i was kind of giving it a lot of action and uh and i looked up at him at some point i said you know should i be using a straight tail because i'm i'm working this thing and i like to work the lures when i fish i don't want to just cast out and just blah, 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 blah. and he said man you can't work that thing too hard to catch a speckled trout and I thought in my pea brain, oh, well, I'm going to show him. And I cast it out there, and I just went crazy. And you know what happened? Boom, got a hit. Whoa, caught a speck. Did it again. Boom, got a hit, caught a speck. And uh, that was when I came to this realization that he, he had a point. You can't work it, it. You can't work it too fast. You can't work it too crazy. These fish really like a herky-jerky. I don't know why. Um, what I find is this is very, uh, very related to the current and the tide. And you'll have a period of the tide where they hit the herky jerky like crazy. And if you do your standard rockfish reel, jerk, reel, jerk, reel, jerk, jerk, reel, you don't even get a bite. Uh, and then the tide will change. And all of a sudden the herky jerky does nothing. And these fish want that slow retrieve along the bottom. Totally changes. Um, and I'm just using that as an example. It can, it can be the other way around, you know, with, with the tides and the currents. But the bottom line is, try the herky-jerky. You will be surprised at the results, okay? Chris, take us on to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about where you're going to find these fish. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, spot A versus spot B so much as how to recognize what would be a really good spot. Hey, Lenny. Yes. I, we got a question just as you're kind of talking about that. Pop it up there. Bring it, up. bring it on, man. Um, Anthony wants to know uh, what kind of uh, – can you see it? Because that's actually just not – shallow are we talking? He says you probably get it, but, but, but just how shall we talk about it. So, okay, so what I like, okay, is to have the kind of scenario where when my jig hits the water, it's up close to a shoreline. I mean – a foot or two away, maybe from riprap, maybe from a point, and it might only land in six, eight inches of water. But by the time I've retrieved it three feet off of that shore, it's got at least a foot and a half, two feet of water. And maybe when it comes back farther, I'm in six, eight feet of water. And we are going to look at some specifics. We're actually right about there. Although I forgot a slide. Um, hang tight, Anthony, because we're going to get right to that. And Chris, go ahead and put up the next slide, and we're going we're gonna to build right into this. I forgot top water. Forgot my How could I forget the top water? Oh. So um, a lot of guys swear by top water for specs. They love it. In my experience, you get a lot more of the stripers when you're throwing the top water than the specs. And it's almost always going to be best until the sun is exactly this high off of the horizon in the morning. Once it's that high off the horizon, uh, the top water thing is kind of done. That Exactly that high. Right? <laughs> Hold your arm out. When the sun gets there, stop throwing the top water. Unless it's really cloudy out. That's sometimes it'll keep going. Um, 
the reverse for sunset. You know, it, it, it's not really good till that sun gets really low. But regardless, even during the good top water times, I generally find I get a lot more stripers throwing the top water. It's a lot of fun. I love the top water hit. Holy mackerel. Uh, and one other thing I just want to point out real quick about this slide, um, and that's a Neil, Neil Cohen uh, top water right there. I love those things. They work really well. But you know, put those trebles on there. Come on, man. Put some singles on there. Uh, what I do with those trebles is I'll either replace them entirely with single hooks or I'll clip one of the three tines off. makes it a lot easier to get a fish off and let it go. It's a lot kind of less dangerous swinging around, so you might want to consider that. All right, Chris, take us to the next one. We're going to get to Anthony's question as, as we build into this. So, all right, number one, and I don't, I don't care right here if you're talking about a foot of water or three feet of water. When you see a tidal formed rip, a current formed rip appearing on a point, you've got a spot. Okay, I'm not saying it's going to be awesome today or awesome the day after tomorrow, but you got a spot with real potential wherever you have a visual rip. You can see that rip forming off the point there. That's a spot you want to try. Go ahead to the next one, Chris. We're going to get a little bit more direct on Anthony's question right here. You can see from this shot, we've got a point and we've got a deep spot. We've got a channel that's running pretty close to it. What I generally find, and that spot, uh, if memory recalls, it's like six, eight feet uh, on a low tide. And the spots like that where you got deep water and you're actually like, you could park your boat on that shoal and be close enough to hit land on one side and the, and the channel on the other. It's, that might be 30 yards. Um, in my experience, what you find is on the end of an outgoing and then a dead slack into the beginning of the incoming, that's when that kind of spot is going to shine. And normally you're going to catch the fish a little bit deeper in that spot. It's not, it's not normally going to be, you know, a cast in a quick retrieve. It's going to be letting it sink. It's going to be working the bottom. Um, but that's another, that's the type of spot you want to look for. All right, Chris, go on to the next one. Now, here we have a scenario. Oh, man, you can't see it on screen, can you? It, look at the bow of that. Oh, thank you. That makes it better. Look at the bow of that boat. You can see this guy's got an anchor out, right? You can see it's very windy. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I hate dropping the anchor for this kind of fishing. But when it's really windy out, you might have to. you got to hold that boat in place or else you're going to get in a cast or two and you're going to be past the spot. Go ahead to the next slide, Chris. This is where you can get a really big advantage if you've got the bow mount electric working for you. Now, this boat you see right here, we were actually fishing Eastern Bay this day, but the slide worked perfectly to illustrate this, so I wanted to pop it in here. And we did catch some rockfish up on this riprap. You can see we got the Minn Kota on the bow. This is a Sportsman 25 OE. Love this boat. And having that trolling motor up there gave us two big advantages. The first is we could creep that shoreline, making no noise, and just cast to the riprap until we got a bite. Okay, we got a spot. We want to work this spot. Now what? Press a button. It spot locks the boat in place. The, the, the motor talks to the GPS. The GPS says, dude, hold the boat right here. Don't let it move. And the motor does its work, and it holds you right there, and you can just cast over and over and over again. Clearly, far, far, far superior to dealing with and anchor and chain and making all the noise you're going to make and then oh i got to adjust the boat you got to pull the dang thing up you got to move the boat drop it again oh you ended up in the wrong place blah 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 you get the point that's a really good thing to have on your boat if you have that option absolutely go for it uh chris go ahead and pop us to the next slide because this is another thing i wanted to mention this is walleye pete's boat i'm betting there's some people right now watching this who have fished on this boat it's a 27 foot judge that is a heavy boat that boat has a lot of windage, and you can see the shaft of that Minkoto coming down along the bow. He uses that quite a bit. If you fish with Pete in the, the islands around the Tangier Sound, you'll see him use that quite a bit. In fact, the very first slide we put up of me with the little white paddle tail, that was on his boat in the sound while we were spot locked in place. So don't write it off as not being an option if you have a big boat, a heavy boat, but with a lot of windage. They got models now that can carry up to about a 30 footer. So it's, it's, it, it's a big deal. It makes a big deal of difference. Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide here. Whew. All right. Now, 
Chris, please make this full screen. Before anybody starts screaming at me that I'm spot burning, let me tell you, I've been going to this particular location for at least 30 years. This is Colburn Creek. The red arrow points to the boat ramp. This spot is not a secret. It's in all the DNR guides. It's in all the boat ramp guides. It's on the big NMS, uh, the NMS River uh, just north of Cambridge. And there could be someone watching this right now who's going, oh, God dang it, he's, he's giving away my spot. I go there and there's no one ever there. Well, the reason there's no one ever there is because this is like a two-hour haul from the Bay Bridge. It, it's a long way out there. And it, and it doesn't see a lot of traffic as a result of that. But I really wanted to tell people about this spot in specific because if you're a kayak guy or if you got a 14-foot John boat and you want to do this kind of fishing, you can't just go running out to Bloodsworth or, or running out to Smith in the middle of the Tangier Sound and do it. You need an area like this, and this is a really good spot to apply this type of fishing. I, when, when I was limited in my boat size, uh, I used to go here an awful lot. It's very sheltered except on a straight west wind. If you get a straight west wind at 20 knots, it's going to suck here. Anything else, it's really sheltered. It's great water. Now, we got blue arrows up top. Those are pointing to two really good spec spots. They're very close to the boat ramp, totally within kayak range, totally within very small boat range. Um, the one on the, the right, the point there, uh, gets a nice little tidal rip on it. You do need a moving current there for that spot to work. The one at the top middle, that's where a creek comes out of the marsh and feeds into the, uh, in, into the cove there and then into the river. That water uh, warms up on a high tide and on the beginning of an outgoing. You'll, you'll go up there and anything but a kayak will likely have to tilt the motor up or you'll run aground, even in a John boat, getting up there. But once you get up there, there's a nice hole right in the mouth of that creek. It drops down to three, four, five feet, depending on the tide. And uh, you should stop shy of that and cast into it, okay? And then pull up into it and then start casting some more. Um, that, that hole goes up into that creek quite a ways. It's a really, really, really good spot. And like I said, I think it's really important that the small boat people know about this place. Places like this exist. This is just a starting point. You can find, oh my gosh, there got to be at least a dozen spots like this where you can get cover from the wind. And you, you can, there's, there's one at the top of the mannequin as well. Um, you can get cover from the wind. You can fish the small boat. You can fish the kayak and you can get in on this fishery. Now, why in the heck did I put that green arrow right in the middle of the river there? Well, the reason I threw it in there is because this is actually a really good flounder spot. Uh, you can kind of see in this shot how you got dark water there. There's a, there's a deep channel that runs up. And um, when you get to the midday hours, maybe the speck bite dies out, the rockfish bite dies out, go to that channel edge and try bouncing a five-inch gulp jerk shad in chartreuse or white right along the drop-off. You got a lot of flounder there. Really good spot. Used to be a really good weak fish spot you know, back when we had weak fish. Hopefully that'll, you know, come back to us. But uh, for now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to go there and try and catch weeks because it just hasn't been so good in recent years. But, uh, but keep that spot in mind. That's a really, really, really good one. Woo. All right, Chris, we got any questions coming up here? Yeah, Lenny. Uh, let's see. Let me just hide this. We've got um, Vince here. He's asking about the Z-Man trout trick. Hmm. Interesting. I have not tried those in specific. However, I do like uh, the bass, I'm going to call it the bass assassin style because they kind of started with those, the finesse style where you get the straight tail and then the split. All that kind of stuff will work. Absolutely no question about it. The one thing I'm going to say, and I don't know what size those trout tricks are, but the one thing I'm going to say is I do find with the specs, I like a four inch bait. I'm not not so hot on the six inch baits when it comes to the specs. I don't know if they just like attacking smaller stuff, but even big specs, it just seems to me that those four inchers, I really like those smaller baits. A five inch uh, gulp I would absolutely cast for them. They probably don't have the greatest action in the world, but once a fish grab them, they don't let go. Um, but I, you know, 
I wouldn't hesitate to. The Z-Mans in general, I love when the bluefish are around. Now, of course, in this kind of fishery, you're not going to – normally, you're not going to encounter a whole lot of bluefish. Uh, but I wouldn't hesitate. I would say get some pink. <laughs> All right. We got Chris here uh, talking about popping cork. Okay. So, boy, is that an interesting question. Uh, I have not tried and would be very interested in trying a natural bait under a popping cork in the spec zone in the Chesapeake. Now, I have tried the standard Florida popping cork tactics in the Chesapeake a gazillion times. Uh, well, not a gazillion times. Probably 15, 18 years ago, I tried importing it to see if it would work. It did not. Three, four, five years ago, uh, I did some snook spec redfish fishing with popping corks and i decided to try it again and I, I brought this stuff up here it did not work in fact in one shallow water spot um the spot where the picture had the picture of dave with the, the pinky on it um i watched everybody around me catch fish for like 20 minutes and got like one hit that i missed and was like all right forget the popping cork and i got rid of it now here's what's interesting the uh, uh, the Thomas X, uh, the Boston, but no, gosh, help me out, Zach. We plug in what the heck they make. The, the food they, they brought the popping corks up here is Julie, Julie and Mike. Um, they brought the popping corks up here and started selling them up here, and they claimed they were really effective. And uh, I was kind of like. I'm not buying it, you know, and, but they were like, no, no, these things really work. So I was like, all right, come out on the boat with me. We went fishing and I'll be darned if we didn't catch a ton of fish on the popping courts, but it was a very different technique. It was not the Florida technique. It wasn't the pop and sit, pop and sit. It was actually more like a cast and a retrieve with a chug, 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 chug. I think, I think we got it here. Zach says hardhead custom baits. Hardhead custom baits. Thank you, Zach. And I apologize, Julie Mike, for, for going blank on you. My brain is old and mushy. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're still on these popping cork rigs. you got about a three-foot leader underneath the cork, and then you've got a probably a four-inch paddle tail style plastic. And using a chug, chug, chug style retrieve was highly effective. Um, now, we were not in the spec zone doing that. We caught a ton of rockfish doing that. We caught blues. We caught Spanish mackerel on them. Uh, and they told me that down in the packs, that was one of the rigs they were using a lot for the specs and having good luck on them. And after seeing them in action, I, I totally, totally buy it. So I would say apply the technique. Yes, absolutely. But don't apply it the way they do it in Florida. Don't do the chug and sit. It, it just, for whatever reason, does not seem to interest the fish up here. Give it the constant chug. Um, and like I said at first, I would be curious about doing the chug and sit if I had, you know, big live shrimp on that hook instead of a uh, plastic. The Tangier did have real shrimp in it, real shrimp last year, not grass shrimp. Um, first time I ever heard of that, but they were getting them in crab pots. They were getting them in traps. They absolutely were around. I think you'd have to be crazy to think the specs wouldn't be trying to eat them, right? So that might be something there. All right. We got Paul. Do you typically match jig head color to tail color white or why not? Good question, Paul. I do not. I absolutely do not because I like a little contrast in a bait. And if I have a, a skirted bait, I'm a little bit less worried about the head versus the tail because I'm getting contrast, right? We've got contrast in something like this, uh, but a not skirted bait, which which is normally what I'm going to reach for. I'm normally going to reach, honestly, I'm normally going to reach for that four foot, uh, four foot, that four inch white paddle tail is going to be my number one starter bait when I'm fishing in these shallows. Uh, and, and that will go on a different color head. It will not be a white head. Uh, might be chartreuse, might be red you know, might, might be a pink, something a little different to give it that contrast. If you look at, I think pretty much any fish, but particularly a bait fish, you know, you look at a bunker, you look at whatever, there's always going to be a little bit of contrast between the head and the body and maybe a little at the tail too. Um, and last year BKD came out with the, the dip tails, the pre-dip tails that had a different color. I did real well with them. Um, 
I'm not I'm not sure which way you go is critical, but I, I think it is important to have some contrast in there. I, I'm not saying I don't think you'll catch fish if you don't if you just match them up, but I, th I kind of I feel like that gives you an edge. Never put it to the test. I'm gonna have to put that to the test, and I'm gonna hand some poor soul on my boat a white head and a white tail, and I'm gonna be casting the red and white. We're gonna fish side by side and see which one does it, because that's really the only way to tell for sure. But as a rule through the years, I do go for contrast. Chris, we got any more questions? Uh, Paul's was our last one that I see in our docket here, um, unless you've got something you want to add. We covered what I wanted to cover. Uh, you know, anybody, if you've got any questions popping in your head, plug them in there real fast. I'll yeah. also say if you plug them in in the future, I will do my best to stay on top of them. What I have found is that in the week following, um, I'm pretty good about keeping up with it. And then once it gets beyond that, I, I kind of lose track of which ones are new and what's not. And uh, I'm not real great at keeping track of the Facebook thing in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm going to say a week out, it's kind of, you know, eh, eh, might, might be a little hopeless. But, but by all means, if any questions hit you in the next hour, two hours, two days, whatever, Stick them in there. Yeah. I will say one thing. Let me let me throw in one thing, Chris. I'm sure. sorry. I did forget to just say one thing. Last year was a good spec year in the sound. We're already getting good numbers of reports from the sound. So if if you wanted to go do this tomorrow, I would say go down to the Tangier or the Pocomoke and fish those waters, that lower eastern shore, anywhere from the Tangier south, uh, anywhere down there, and you're you're likely to get into these fish. Well, okay. Now that you've asked for it, we've got a few more questions. So uh -oh. I'm going to pop them up. Um, anybody, any comment on the sparkle? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe it makes a difference. Sometimes, maybe it doesn't. I, I got to tell you, I've, I've. That's not much of a comment. Uh, well, <laughs> I've certainly, I've certainly tried the glitter. I've certainly tried the add-on scents. It's not something that I really have become dedicated to through the years. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, I, I find that that little white guy that I got right on there, you know, that usually does the trick. And I, I'm, I'm certain that there are days when it could make a difference. I'm certain that there are days when, you know, the weirdest bait in the world turns out to be the one the specs want, the ones the rock want. Uh, that's why you change, right? I mean, maybe I should have said, if I'm doing this kind of fishing and I've fished for 45 minutes with that little white guy and I'm not getting bit, it will be changed, mm -hmm. okay? It will be changed. I probably won't last 45 minutes. I might only last 20 casts. If I think there are fish there and I'm not getting bites, I will rapidly change stuff up. Uh, I got a little bit of an advantage in that normally I'm on a boat with a lot of different people. Uh, I take a lot of different folks out on my boat. Everybody's going to start with something different. There will be pink in there. There will be a little white paddle tail in there. There will be a chartreuse in there. And if somebody doesn't catch a fish, you know, pretty darn quickly, I'll start swapping stuff out. When somebody does catch a fish, I will pay attention. And it might be a sparkle. And if it's a sparkle and 15 casts later, Mr. Sparkle has caught three fish and no one else has caught a fish, you can you can bet your bottom dollar sparkles are coming out and they're going on the other, they're going on the other lines, right? I mean, a big key here is just to keep changing stuff. With or against the current retreat. Okay, Doug. All right. You got me with this one. This one's going to get me excited. <laughs> so I'm betting that you and most other people watching this right now have watched bait fish swimming in the water before. They've watched bait fish uh, maybe swimming in a, in a stream or a river, right? They've watched shoals of bait swimming. They almost always swim into the current. Now, if they get attacked, they'll scatter. They'll go left, right, down current, all over the place. But what do they do afterwards? They turn and swim into the current. I really like my baits to either swim into the current or across the current. Okay? There are days when, because of the way the boat's positioned, I'm throwing up current and I catch a fish. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I really, truly believe that to get the most natural presentation, you want your bait swimming either up current or across the current. And I, I work to accomplish that. When I position my boat, I'm always that's something I've always got in mind. Always, 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 always. Awesome. Here we go with Pascal. Oh. 
since Tangier is so far, I will not be there first thing in the morning. Does the midday flight work? I'm with you, Pascal. <laughs> when I was young, if I wasn't the first boat to launch at the boat ramp that day, I was angry. I was angry at myself for not getting up 20 minutes earlier. These days, it's a long shot to be at the boat ramp at daybreak, much less to be at a boat ramp two hours away at daybreak. It'll happen in Ocean City, but not not often elsewhere. Um, so the answer is yes, but you need the right tide. Okay, the specs are quite current and tide oriented, and like I was saying, they'll change the way they're biting as the current and the tide change. So you kind of need to play that. You got to pay attention to that. If you've got you know, if you're going to get somewhere at four o'clock in the afternoon and you've got a steady tide until evening, you might have a slow afternoon in store for you. You know, you, you still might catch some fish, but it's not ideal. You're going to you're going to want to look for those times when you get a change in the tide. Um, high in the shallows is commonly going to be better than low. Not always, especially if you find one of those deep channels going up, up along the edges, but just as a kind of a general thing, high tide, incoming, a rushing incoming is really, really good. Um, so I'd say that's as important as time of day, setting aside the top water bite, right? Because for the top water bite, you kind of got to be there at daybreak or at sunset, one or the other. And just for the record, if you're willing to stay there until the sun goes down, the sunset bite is every bit as good as the daybreak bite, in my opinion you know, most of the time, it's not always going to be true, but just generally speaking, most of the time, the sunset bites just as good as a daybreak bite. Okay. How important is clarity? Oh man. So clarity is, it's pretty important. It's one of those things that we can't control. It's one of those things that like, you know, if you've, if you've had a south wind blowing up the area you plan on fishing for a week at 20 knots, it's, it's going to be a kind of a critical thing, but as a general rule of thumb, um, particularly in the Tangier, not so much in the Pokemon, but in, in the Tangier around the islands, um, there will be days when you'll get there and either the western side or the eastern side will be clear and the other side will be a mess. And you want to take that into account. You do want to take that into account. Um, don't write off the dirty water particularly for the rockfish, they do a little better with, with the Merc sometimes. Um, and don't write it off because sometimes you'll find if you've got a west, let's, I'm just using it for example, you've got a west wind, it's blowing up against the uh, western side of those islands, sometimes that'll kind of push bait in there. And fish will actually, rockfish in particular, will actually kind of groove on that. And they'll feed on some of those areas pretty hard. Um, that's assuming it's murky, but not like a total mess, you know? What will happen sometimes in the sound is you'll get down there and there will be guys running crab scrapes for soft crab in the grass beds. And when they do that, they can tear it up pretty good and you'll get real murk areas. In those specific scenarios, I've never done well. Actually, when I see them scraping, and let's say there's an outgoing tide and, and the water's coming down from them. Uh, I'll, I'll go up above them in a heartbeat. I won't even try below them because that, that does really muddy up the water sometimes. And, and I've, I've found that can be kind of a big impediment at times. Um, so pay attention to it. But, you know, it's, it's not a, not a you know, be-all kind of thing. Uh, Lenny, you mentioned the Tangier, and Jay wants to know when, uh, when the flounder's going to show up. Flounder? I see specs on my screen. I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong one. Here it is. Oh, Jay. Hey, Jay. Oh, whoa. Jay. Bye, Jay. Uh, Bye, when Vince. will Flounder show up in the Tangier? Vince, we have had reports. Uh, last week, we got the very first report of Flounder. I think it was actually in the Pokemoke. But when they're in the Pokemoke, they're in the Tangier. Uh, they could easily be there. I would expect them to, to get better and better as the season progresses. But you could absolutely, it would not even surprise me a tiny little bit if someone sent me a picture tomorrow of a nice flounder caught in the Tangier. Okay. Now let's go back to Jay. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, Jay. What time of the season was that speck caught by the West River? What month was speck caught by the West River? Okay. So that fish was in 
that fish in particular was in late September, but we started catching them there in August. And we caught them there through August, through September. I think at the end of September, I don't think we ever caught you there in October. It wouldn't surprise me if I did. Um, but I, I think that, you know, August, September is kind of usually your best bet then. And, and I haven't done this, but I do know guys who are reliable who have told me that they, they have a fairly reliable spec fishery all the way up in the Severn uh, in that late summer, early fall kind of phase. Um, I don't hear about numbers quite as big, you know, three a day, something like that maybe. Uh, and I think they're fishing bait actually, and I'm not exactly sure where, but, but they're, they're up there that late summer, early fall kind of time period. Um, when I go to that spot, I, I tend to fish that, that spot a lot simply because it's right outside the West river. So it's, you know, real close to home for me. And whenever I'm headed South, it's kind of on the way. So I hit that spot an awful lot, um, and I'll generally go there. I mean, shoot, I went there the night before last. Uh, I cruised out of here at five o'clock and went and threw jigs for rockfish. I, I hit it then. Um, it was four thirty. I'm sorry. It was four thirty. It was four thirty. No, no, I waited. Till <laughs> I, waited till <laughs> I wanted that sunset bite. All right. Uh, <laughs> but in any case. Um, what I'm getting at is, you know, all times of the year, I hit that spot quite a bit. And, and I don't think I've ever found them there before August. Cool. Let's talk about the Honga River. Oh, I love the Honga. Honga's fantastic. It's fantastic. Uh, I've many, 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 many times I've launched at, uh, I think it's called Church Creek, the ramp there at the base of the bridge, right before you hit the, the first bridge. And, um, it's another spot that, that gets good protection. It's a good small boat spot. Of course, that's where the cut is. Um, that's probably the most famous speckled trout spot uh, in the area. Used to be better than it is now, and it gets kind of, it, it does get a lot of traffic. A lot of times you go there, there's four boats already. It's kind of too many for the spot. Um, if, if you're wondering what the cut is, just look for Roten Island, spelled with a W, and you'll find it. Um, but, but again, you know, I gotta warn you that that spot gets a lot of traffic. Um, uh, but you don't have to fish just there in the Honga. The Honga through the years has been really good to me. I really, really like it. A lot of times when I'll go is I'll, I'll run down and hit the cut quick. And then if it's not happening, I'll run back out. And on the, uh, Island side, there are several little cuts and channels that make several little different marsh islands and there are a couple that go into the islands that drain on an outgoing tide that have warm water a lot of those spots can be really really good it's very very good and just as a added bonus uh, a lot of rockfish through these same zones occasional flounder and uh the actual the bridge itself has riprap oh I'm going to remember wrong, but for sure on the north side, it's got riprap right at the base, and you got the pilings there. Uh, I've never done incredibly well with specs there. I've caught some there. Never done incredibly well with them, but that's a really good rock for spot. Really good rock for spot. Awesome. Um, I guess we got time for one last one from Cray. Asking Cray? about redfish, the magic spinnerbait. What do you got? I have not tried that one. I have not tried that one. I don't know it. I don't know it, Cray. I'm not going to try it out now. Damn, I thought that was going to be a great one. I don't know that one. I think that's pretty much what we got here. Um, I think you've answered pretty much everyone's questions, and we're just about out of time anyway, so it's actually a pretty good uh, transition here. Excellent. Uh, then he, uh, tomorrow or this weekend looks to be okay to get out there. Uh, what are you going to be doing? Finally. Mike, so so actually, we we uh, we have run out. Me and, me and the boys have run, my, my boys have run out uh, three out of the last four evenings after work, just to do some light tackle stuff, just to catch and release, since we finally can again, right? And uh, the last two two have been so absurdly windy that it was really, I mean, it's basically unfishable. We still tried. Right, sure. It was basically unfishable because it was so darn windy. And uh, yesterday in particular, anybody who fished yesterday, it was a bash your brains out kind of day. 
Uh, now, as you know, you've been on my boat. I can run through that stuff no problem. But when you stop and fish, it's like you know you can't you can't feel a one ounce jig on the end of the line because your line goes. Well, that's true on any boat, but I'll tell you, you I, I like you really kind of sold me on the cat. It was nice. <laughs> we can cut through some seas. That is yeah, not a problem. Absolutely. That is not a problem. But when it's blowing twenty knots, you, you just can't fish anyway. It kind of stinks. So yeah. I'm very much looking forward to this weekend and having some not hideous wind. And uh, I don't know what it's doing out there right now. Uh, Treetops are still moving a little bit. I don't know. I got I, I got enough of that the last couple of nights. I've told myself, don't go tonight if it's going to blow. Wait till tomorrow. So maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. But yeah, um, yeah. But you know, there's there's some some light tackle jigging action. Um, we we certainly haven't caught anything that was even close to keeper size fishing with that method. If if you want to get those fish, go troll. That's really going to be your best bet. Or you can chum and you get a shot at them. Right, and you're going to catch catfish in all likelihood. I'm going to say from Thomas Point North because last time I chummed at Thomas Point, I guess it was ten days ago now. Uh, catfish, big old catfish. I can't make my arms wide enough on the screen to show you how big the catfish were. Uh, and that's the reports I've been hearing from the guys at Hackett's, the guys at Padickery. A lot of catfish. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good fishing going on. All I'm going to say is get out there. Yeah, they're delicious. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Lenny. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. We had a great crowd. Um, and, uh, I, I just want to remind everybody, Hey, if you, if you find this informative, if you find this entertaining, tell somebody, uh, share it, like it, whatever you got to do, but, um, please, the, the greater the audience, the better for us, uh, the better for our advertisers and they, and we can continue doing this on and on and on. So, um, until next time, Thursdays at five o'clock, we'll do this again. Uh, we'll have something posted here. Uh, relatively soon, probably next week, about what our next topic is going to be. But uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Enjoy your evening and uh, enjoy your weekend, and good luck out there. Thanks, Lenny. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, folks. Okay. Bye-bye. Don't miss another cool fish talk video. Click below to subscribe.